26. Well, they got out fast. Didn't they? Came to pass, when Jesus had finished all these sayings, He said unto His disciples, You know that after two days is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. Then assembled together the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people unto the palace of the high priest who was called Caiaphas, and consulted that they might take Jesus by subtlety and kill Him. But they said, Not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the people. Now when Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, there came unto Him a woman having an alabaster box, a very precious ointment, and poured it on His head as He sat at need. When Jesus saw it, they had indignation, saying, To what purpose is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. When Jesus understood it, He said unto them, Why trouble ye the woman? For she hath wrought a good work upon me. For ye have the poor always with you, but me ye have not always. For in that she hath poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this, that this woman hath done, be told for a memorial of her. Let's pray. Father, help us this morning as we remember this woman who was so faithful. Remember an individual who embraced what you said, believed it by faith, and acted on it. Father, I pray that you would teach us the same thing this morning. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've left the portion of Matthew that talks about future events, and we are in our time going back to the present where Jesus is dealing with His disciples, trying to prepare them for the days ahead. I don't know about you, but I cannot imagine being with someone who is really physically in their absolute prime and realizing that in a few short days events that are so radically different than the way they are are going to transpire and literally in a couple of days that person is going to go to the cross and die. It's a shocking statement and um, I have actually come across people that are not able to deal with the death of a loved one with regard to belief. Uh, there are a lot of shows and movies that are spin-offs of this, but one I think of is uh, a little House on the Prairie episode. I, uh, my wife watches Little House on the Prairie. She has all of them. I bought them for her. Uh, and that's my, my mistake, my, my problem, my fault, whatever you want to call it. She loves Little House on the Prairie. And really, are, in, in its day, I guess, Little House on the Prairie is some of the better television programming. And anyway, they've got some of the most depressing episodes on Little House on the Prairie. I used to joke about somebody's always dying, something terrible, somebody's always getting deathly sick, something awful is always happening. And, you know, I'm just such an optimistic soul, I can't watch something like that. It just makes me cry, you know, so I can't watch Little House on the Prairie. But there's an episode that my wife has watched, and there's this elderly man whose wife had died years before, and he's basically locked up in his house, and he talks to her. He just doesn't believe that she's actually dead. He doesn't believe she's actually gone. And, well, I don't remember how the whole thing goes, because I can't watch it. It's just too hard for me to, you know, to, to deal with a man and his sorrow and his well. Why do people want to watch stuff like that? Why do people want to cry? I don't know, but people do. They like, you know. I remember when I was a uh, when I was youth pastor in Delray Beach. I stayed in a home with a family there, and I remember coming into the living room, and the lady just sobbing, just crying. And just, oh, that was such a good movie. And I'm thinking, well, how could that be a good movie? You're crying. It's terrible. It's, why would you do that to yourself? Why would anyone want to cry? But anyways, the, some of you folks, I'm sure, fit into that category of it's great because it made you cry. And this would be one of those episodes. Well, this poor elderly gentleman, his wife has been dead for years. And little Laura is, is trying to figure out who he's talking to all the time. And I understand him. And then she basically confronts him with the reality. Your wife is dead. She's been dead. And that sort of thing for a long time. Well, there are people that just 
refuse to believe something so tragic as the loss of a loved one. If you had been with Jesus in his ministry, if you had lived in the time that Jesus on a daily basis healed multitudes of sicknesses, diseases, and cast out devils, if you had seen Jesus lay, raise Lazarus from the dead, you would be under the impression that this is the kind of person that will never die. Wouldn't you a little bit? Uh, Jesus asked uh, his disciples, he said, said, who do men say that I am? And they said, well, they say that you're John the Baptist. They say that you're uh, one of the prophets. They say, and Jesus said, who do you say that I am? And, and Peter said, thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. I want to say this morning that the disciples of the Lord Jesus understood that he was God. They knew that he was God. They knew that he was eternal God in heaven. But they just didn't get some things. And I believe the reason they didn't get it is because they didn't want to. They didn't want to believe it. Here we are at Bethany. Here Jesus is at the house of Simon the leper. And we see the narrative unfolding that there are events that are happening in the background. The background events are that the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people are in the palace of the high priest and they are plotting to literally figure out a way that they can accuse Jesus of something, take Him, and put Him to death. That is the real-time event. Now let me ask you a question. A couple of weeks ago, before we began answering these end-time prophecy events, we were looking at what Jesus was doing with the Pharisees. Was Jesus, here's the question, was Jesus popular with the Pharisees? Was He popular with the chief priest? Was he popular with the elders of the people? And the answer is they absolutely hated him. And his last words to them had been, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Now today, hypocrite is a worse word than it was back then. But he called them pretenders or fakes. Literally, here you are and you are this polished, presidential looking spiritual authority. You are this leader of the people that everyone looks at and on the outside you are absolutely the picture of perfection. You've got it together. Listen, they probably even used good grammar for all I know. They literally looked as though there was nothing in their life that could be wrong. If you went to lunch with a Pharisee, my friend, you'd have been uncomfortable the whole time because he'd have been better at everything than you. He would have looked better at everything than you. If you went into the temple with one of the Pharisees, you would have been uncomfortable because he would have been a better person than you. He would have been more religious. Everything that he was was better than you. These are the kind of people that you are, they are, and Jesus just exposes them because he doesn't look on the outside. He doesn't look at the suit that they're wearing. He doesn't look, and I know they didn't wear suits in case anybody's confused about that. He doesn't look at the dress on the outward appearance. doesn't look at whether or not they look fundamental. doesn't look at whether they carry a big enough Bible. He doesn't look at whether or not uh, you know, they pull into the parking lot just so, and if they use the Christian vernacular, Christian terms, and say hallelujah and praise the Lord exactly right. He doesn't check those things. He looks right into the heart. And in the heart, he sees, first of all, that they do not love God. He sees that they do not believe in Him as God's Son. That they are not looking for a Messiah. They are not looking for God to work in national Israel. They are not looking for even God to come and rule and reign among them. They do not want God. They have made themselves God. They have made themselves the representatives for God. They've replaced God with themselves, with their little religion. Everybody's looking up to them. They're looking down at everyone else. And they're fakes. They're imposters. And Jesus says, you're actors. You are pretending to be what you look like, but that is not what you are inside. Now, friend, I'm not Jesus. You never have to be afraid of that from me. You never have to be afraid that I tell pastor something and he can see right in my heart and tell that I'm lying. There are a couple of times... Uh, when I've said things that I had no idea what the person thought I meant. There have been a couple of times when 
I just made a statement to somebody who was guilty about something. And I wasn't even talking about what they were talking about, but they thought I knew something in their heart. They thought I knew uh, what, what they had done. And I just made a statement. I mean, it literally just terrified them. He said, how does he know? And they think that it, you know, a pastor has some kind of... I didn't even know. I just... I remember uh, one time, and I can't tell you what it was, but I remember something, that, and later on, I thought, they think I know something. And so I just went back and I said, "You, what, what is it you think I know? Let's talk about it. And I mean, it just all came out. <laughs> you know, and, uh, friend, that's, that's Jesus. That isn't pastor. See, I don't know your secrets. I don't know... Uh, the things that you've thought. I don't know the things you've said. I don't know whether you're sincere or uh, false. I don't know any of those things, but Jesus does. And He has exposed the hypocrites. He's not popular with them. And they realize that if people believe what He said about them, what's going to happen to them? See, there's no way that they can exist alongside of Jesus. They can't be in control of the temple and it be the actual legitimate place that belongs to God. Listen, if it's Jesus' house, it can't be their house. So they've got to kill Him. That's what's happening here, and yet from the perspective of the disciples, there is absolute denial. The disciples in their minds are thinking, Jesus can never die, He's God. Well, let's just ask a practical question. Let's relate to them a little bit here this morning. You don't want to be too hard on them, do you? Let's relate to them this morning a little bit. Do you believe God could die? You ever thought about the plan of redemption? Sometime it may help you just to think, okay, not literally forgetting the cross, but pretending the cross hadn't already happened, and you are God's natural born enemy, which you and I are. What can I do? to reconcile with God. Would you have ever thought of God sending His Son to die in your place as, as the redemption plan? God, I'm asking You to send Jesus to die and receive my judgment. I couldn't ask God for that, could you? No. God sent You, and you know, I deserve to die. I deserve death and hell. I'm a wicked sinner. That's the reality. That's what you and I actually are. So here's my proposition. God, how about sending your sinless son to live a perfect life and killing him instead of me? That's preposterous. I could receive it, but I could never ask for it to be offered. Neither could you, really. But I don't want to die, but I deserve to. That's the bottom. That's what it really comes down to. That's the bottom line. I may not want to die, but I deserve to. Jesus freely offered Himself. Went to the cross. And He's explained that to His disciples in John chapter 14. We know Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe in also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go there to prepare a place for you. And if I go there to prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. And the disciples say, uh-uh. <laughs> no, that's, that's not a good plan. Jesus, everything in your plan is good except for you dying. Okay, now that just brings us to a simple text this morning. And by the way, Mother's Day would be a good day to preach this message. It happens to be Father's Day, so here we go. Here's the good thing about Father's Day. Mother's Day, you've got to be nice to the moms, right? But Father's Day, I believe it's every pastor's duty to beat up the men. And so here's a good chance to do it, right? And isn't it true? You're supposed to preach hard to fathers. You fathers, you need to be real fathers. You're a bunch of deadbeats instead. You need to show leadership. No, actually guys would enjoy that. Real men would say, you know what, go ahead, sock it to me, I need help, I need good preaching, and they wouldn't mind. But uh, this would be a good Mother's Day message today, it just happens to fall on Father's Day, that's the way it came out. But there's an amazing contrast between the man and the lady in this text of the Scripture, an amazing contrast, it's, a, it's amazing. Okay, so here's what Jesus begins to teach His disciples, look at verse 6. Now,
Now when Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, there came unto Him a woman having an alabaster box, a very precious ointment, and poured it on His head as He sat at meat. But when His disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, To what purpose is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. When Jesus understood it, He said unto them, Why trouble you the woman? For she hath wrought a good work upon me. For ye have the poor always with you. But me ye have not always. For in that she hath poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Let's look at verse 12 again. For in that she hath poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Now herein we find a major contrast. And it's a major contrast in practical living faith. I like what Brother Chris said this morning because it fits with this. He talked about when we planted Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church. Literally, people moved here with no opportunity. Uh, when Brother Chris moved here uh, to go to Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church, he didn't have a job, didn't have a place to live, didn't have a church to go to. We didn't have people writing us and saying, please come here and lead Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church. We'll be the church. You be the leadership. We need you all. Come on down. We just saw that in the city of Fort Lauderdale there wasn't a single independent Baptist church that was English speaking in the entire city. We thought there needs to be. And so we saw a need, but the opportunity was really the fact that God was leading us just to do something, just to serve. I got in my motor home and drove south. Lost two engines on the way here. Spent all the money I was going to use for startup money for our church, all my personal finances, to fix the engine in my motorhome. Just to get here to start a church. Didn't have an income for two years. In other words, what we did was because we knew there was a need. It wasn't because there was opportunity, it was because there was a need and we knew God wanted it. We were convinced God wants a ministry to be here, wants a ministry like the one that He's laid on our hearts, and we're going to do it. And that is the story of Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church really coming together. That's, that's where it came from. We, uh, that's how we're going to see Miami Beach Baptist Church come together. Just seeing a need and just people being willing to do whatever the Lord wants and taking steps of faith. God always honors faith. But in our text this morning, we find two examples. We have people that Jesus has told very, very plainly, very clearly, I'm going to die. The kingdom that you think I'm here to set up, I'm not going to set up. I came to die. The ministry that I have isn't going to be done the way you think the ministry is going to be done. I'm going to leave. I'm going to die and I'm going to be buried. I'm going to be raised again the third day and then I'm going to heaven. And y'all are staying. I don't know about you, but that wouldn't be what I'd want to hear at the time. Would it be for you? Literally, the disciples of the Lord Jesus have been uprooted. The fishermen have left off fishing and followed Jesus. The physicians have left off being physicians and followed Jesus. The tax collectors have left their, uh, their position of being tax collectors and followed Jesus. They're disciples of the Lord Jesus and the disciples of follower. And when the leader leaves, what are you as a disciple? You ever think about that? I mean, when Peter, as one of the twelve, says, I go fishing, I go fishing, why did he say that? He said, because I don't know what to do. Jesus is not here for me to follow. I don't know what to do. And so he did not want to believe, and neither did the rest of the disciples want to believe, that Jesus was going to die. That did not fit with anything that they had dedicated their lives to. Jesus had said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. But He did not say, follow me and after a little bit of time I'll die and then you'll go through terrible hardship and I'll use you as the foundational gifts to plant churches and begin a whole entire dispensation and you can do it without me being bodily, physically present. How do you like being sent somewhere to do a task? Most of the time when I send somebody somewhere, they end up saying, call us, Pastor, the people here said, I love to just say, well, figure it out. Don't come back empty-handed. Just get it done. Get the job done. Figure it out. That's tough, isn't it? Most of us want to say, we, I mean, we're, able, we're willing to do the task, but we want the details of the task. 
We want to be supplied with what we need in order to do it. Not just say, well, just do it. Go do it. Figure it out. That's literally what the disciples are faced with, and so they just didn't believe it was going to die. Here he is in the midst of them, and he's just as healthy as he's ever been. His power is not diminished. He's recently raised Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus is dead four days and Jesus raises him. That's probably Jesus' greatest miracle. I don't know how you rate miracles. But it's, aside from forgiving sin, which is the greatest thing that Jesus did, that's probably the greatest thing He did. And here He is, literally in the peak of His popularity, perhaps a couple of weeks off of the peak of His popularity. He's, they literally have been at the height of ministry... Things are heating up, if you will. The scribes, the Pharisees, and the chief priests want to kill him, but he's God, right? Listen, if I run, if I'm on God's side, and somebody's trying to kill God. Yeah, they're mad, but what are they going to do? And now Jesus says they're going to kill me. Can't kill God. Can't kill God, can you? Nobody can lay his life down. They didn't want to believe him. So now here comes this woman. She heard what he said. She takes an alabaster box of precious ointment, she breaks it, and she anoints him. I've been told that the alabaster box's value is somewhere around a year's wages. That may not be very much, or it may be a lot, depending on who you relate it to, but assuming that you make a decent wage, the average income in Fort Lauderdale is 40 something. 40 something a year, thousand. So supposing I had a box worth $40,000, and I walked in here, and I broke it and poured it out. Anybody here ever seen $40,000 just poured out before just, and used up, just gone like that? And you say, Pastor, that happened when I signed a mortgage for a car. Well, that's the same thing, but you don't see it phys physically. Just you drive the car for a while. Literally, they just anointed Jesus' body with it. And Judas, if you read their, if you read other scripture that tells the same account, Judas really threw a fit. He was the treasurer. He kept the bag, and uh, his idea was he should have given that to me. That forty thousand dollars. If I had it, I could have. I mean, think of the poor I could have fed. How many poor people could we feed today with $40,000? You can feed a lot of poor people, couldn't you? Feed poor Charlie, feed poor Soft, feed poor Jonathan, feed poor Pastor, feed all his poor folks. Okay. You can feed a lot of poor, couldn't you, with $40,000? We could all go to the Golden Corral today. <laughs> right, Jonathan? You here? You went? Yeah, Golden Corral? All right, good. Okay, so... Judas' idea is, if you'd given me that, I could have managed it much better. Do you have a good point? Sure. If you don't believe Jesus is going to die. And the other disciples said, you know, you know Judas is right. You know, it would be a lot better to feed the poor than to pour it on the ground. That isn't the right thing to do. That isn't the effective way to do ministry. I mean, what a waste. That is, that is not the right way. And here is a woman who heard what Jesus said, is broken hearted over it, and acted by faith. She said, if Jesus is going to die, then I'm going to anoint his body. And I'm going to do it in a way he can remember. Because I don't want my Jesus to die without me doing something for him. She just believed him. She was different than all the rest of them. She took the alabaster box and she broke it and she poured it on his body. She said, I love you. I want you to know it. And I, I know what you're coming to do. And I... I don't want it, but I don't have a choice. I need you to die for me. She believed him. She acted in faith. And 
the rest of the disciples looked at her and said, boy, how foolish can you be? How wasteful can you be? What a dumb thing that was to waste something so valuable. And they did not consider the object of her faith. My friend, can I say to you today that Jesus must be the object of your faith? Jesus must be the object of your faith. It's only Jesus. And He is not a Jesus who is coming to make you rich and prosperous. He's a Jesus who is coming to give you eternal life. And that is infinitely more valuable than a year of wages. If you could take a year of your life and somehow do something that would earn you eternal life, my friend, what an investment must that be? not. And all she had was something that was valuable that she could use to show gratitude. She just gave what she had. But in it she demonstrated faith. You must be born again, Jesus told Nicodemus. And in order to be born again, you must do it the way that Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Whosoever believeth shall not perish but have eternal life. And that woman believed Jesus. And she believed every word. Now there's some more application here. Don't miss it, Christian. There are commands in the Bible that I fully believe some Christians scoff at. What do you mean, Pastor? Well, I mean when the Bible says, go ye therefore and teach all nations, if you don't do it, you're a scoffer. I've heard Christians before say, well, God just, you know, I mean the people, and people that I know, they're just hard. You're a scoffer if you believe that. There's no such thing as a hard person. What in the world does that mean when you have the power of God's Holy Spirit? When you have the Gospel which has the power to save? Listen, are there any hard people in this room? Are there any people in this room that we could say they would never, ever consider the Gospel? That person would never live a Christian life. That person would never be a Bible-thumping, uh, you know, preaching, whatever. Listen, friend, I'll just be, I'll be as level and honest as I can with you. I'm not a religious person. And if Jesus wasn't real and if God didn't save me and His Holy Spirit wasn't in me, I wouldn't be acting religious today. Wouldn't be in church today. But I've been born again. When God saves you, my friend, it's real. You've got to live like it. you got to act like it. And all this woman is doing is just acting like she believes Jesus. You know, there are some things the Bible teaches about the Christian life that you ought to act like. Now, there's things such as biblical separation that the Bible teaches. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But whoso doeth the will of the Father, or will of God, abideth forever. Well, the world's got its got a stranglehold in your life. It's got a hold of you, and you just don't believe that you could make it in this world living for Jesus. My friend, you're not trying to make it in this world. Do you get that? You're not trying to make it in this world. And when you do, when you act as though you are my friend, you are not exercising faith in Jesus. Pastor, if I gave the way the Bible says I should give, I wouldn't have anything. What would I what would I have? What would I where at? Where, where are you talking about? You're talking in a bank somewhere? You're talking in a safe somewhere? You're talking in a physical land location somewhere in a world that's going to burn and pass away? I should ask you the question, what will you have? If you invest it somewhere that isn't in heaven, my friend, you will certainly lose it. Does the Bible say that? He that loveth his life shall lose it. He that keepeth his life shall lose it. Whoso loseth his life for my sake shall find it. And here we have a contrast. There are twelve disciples. who did not believe. And there's one woman who did. 
It's interesting we remember all of them, right? I should give you a quiz this morning on the 12th disciples. You know what their names were? Matthew. No. Huh? Simon, Peter, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Thomas, Thaddeus. There were a couple of Judases. Uh, anyway, there's Thomas. There's 12 of them. And yet you know Mary. I bet you some of you don't remember all the names of the 12 disciples. But you know Mary, this woman Mary, who broke the alabaster box on Jesus' feet. $40,000 investment into eternity. She just plunked it out and poured it out. Cracked it open, dumped it out. So Today it matters. A thousand a years. Thing. What? That was a good thing. Yes, sir. Because she believed Jesus. She anointed His body. And she believed in His death. And Christian, if you'll believe Jesus, it'll mean an investment. She probably only had that box of ointment. Or she probably only had enough to purchase that box of ointment. That's probably all she had. That's why that's all she poured out. Maybe a year's wages. She just gave Him what she had. Christian, have you given Jesus what you have? Does He have what you have? See, He might may want your house. He may want you to live in it. But He wants it to be His house. He may want your car. He may want you to drive it for Him. But He wants it to be His car. He may want you to wear the clothes in the closet for Him. By the way, make sure they're clothes that would honor Him then. But friend, He wants them to be His. If what you have is yours, you are not like Mary. You are like the twelve. If what you have is not for Jesus, you don't understand like Mary. You understand like the twelve. Now let me ask you a question. Did Jesus plainly spell out that He was going to the cross and going to die and be buried and raised again from the dead in three days? Did He ever plainly say it or did He speak in parables all the time? He said, destroy this body and in three days I'll raise it again. He said, I'm going to die, I'm going to go to the cross and I'm going to be raised again in three days. He said, when that happens, I won't leave you comfortless, but the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, He'll come to you and He'll represent me in you. He told them. And they didn't believe. And you know something? They were not prepared when He died. They weren't ready when he did not when he died. Listen, if if Peter had been ready, he would never have denied the Lord Jesus. He would have said, "Take him to the cross," but he'll be back in three days. Take me and crucify me, but I'll live forever with Jesus. But instead, he denied the Lord Jesus because he was not ready. If the rest of the disciples had been ready, my friend, when Jesus was in the garden, He was praying, He said, couldn't you just wait with me? Couldn't you watch with me for an hour? They would have said, you know what, we'll lose some sleep. But we can prepare for this. Christian, if you don't believe Jesus, you won't be ready. I'm not talking about salvation here this morning. As far as I know, every person in this room to the best of my knowledge, has received Jesus as their Savior. I don't know the hearts of people. You know God knows. But I don't. As far as I know, everybody has. But you're either ready for Him to come or you're not. But you know the Scripture warns believers who are saved to be watching. Watching means wake, awake, looking, Doing what you're supposed to do. <laughs> we got tasks to do in this place. It'd be interesting if I asked somebody to paint this tram, which still needs to be painted here. It'd be interesting if I asked somebody to caulk the bottom of the tram and paint it. 
and uh, say, well, I'm going to go away for four hours, see if you can get it done in the four hours that I'm gone. And if you were to get your paint, your paintbrush, and, and uh, all your things to keep the trim from uh, getting, or the wall from getting painted instead of trim, and you were to hold your paintbrush in your hand and watch for me to come back, wouldn't get the job done, would it? See, if you're going to try to get it done in four hours, you're going to be painting very steadily. You're not going to be looking out the window, but when you're painting, you're preparing for me to come back in four hours and be done, right? If I were paying you, if I came back and you were watching out the window, I'd fire you. But since I work with volunteers, I don't have that privilege. <laughs> it's not a privilege anyway, I'm just joking. Do you understand what I'm saying? Watching is not, oh, I'm just looking for Jesus. Jesus, do something. I'm waiting for you. Watching is working. Faithfully, diligently, doing what you're supposed to be doing. And even if I came back in two hours, if you were really watching, you'd be watching the baseboard. Get paint put on it. You know, if we're watching right now, you know what we'll be doing? We'll be telling people about Jesus. We'll be figuring out ways that we can access more people and preach the gospel more and that we can build Christ's church more because we'll be getting ready for Jesus. That's how you watch. You don't do it by saying, well, they should have done that. should have done that. No, you do it by investing. And so Jesus said, in that she hath poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Verily or truly I say unto you, wheresoever the gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this, that this woman hath done, be told for a memorial of her. Today we're talking about it because she exercised faith. A couple thousand years ago, a woman believed Jesus. No one else did, but she did. They thought she was a fool. They thought she was wasteful. But she was the only one that believed. The final thing I want to say this morning is that though you may be in a minority, if you do what God says you're to do, you'll please Him. Sometimes we look for the crowd, don't we? Look for the successful. Look for the people that are doing uh, ministry in a way that you know works and is practical and is hip and cool and accepted. God's not interested in any of that. Couldn't care less about programs or methods or popularities. Just doesn't care about that at all. He's interested in faith. Faithfulness is a person believing Him and living like it. This woman believed in His burial and lived like it. A Christian, you're supposed to believe in His coming and live like it. Jesus is coming. He's told us what to do. Let's look at it. Look, turn over two pages or so in your Bible, maybe three to Matthew chapter 28, and look at verse 18 or verse 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Let's finish by looking at this very quickly. Before Jesus came, He said, I'm going to be back. I am coming. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to go and teach all nations. So where should we go? Everywhere. Who should we teach? Everyone. Everyone everywhere. And what should we do after they receive it? Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. You know what Jesus wants us to do? He wants us to preach the gospel. And he wants us to get people to, uh, to follow Jesus. Baptism is a sign of following Jesus. It is an open public proclamation that I believe in the death, the burial, and the resurrection. You see the picture here? In the same way that this woman baptized Jesus with this ointment, she showed that she believed in His death and His burial and His resurrection. There's a picture of baptism here. And now, uh, we're told, if you want to identify with Jesus, get baptized. Teach people to be baptized because what you're saying is, I believe in the death, the burial, and the resurrection. That's what she said when she anointed Him with ointment. Just a minute, okay? When she anointed Him with ointment, she said, I believe in the death, the burial, and the resurrection. And when you get baptized, you're telling people, I have believed in the death, the burial, and the resurrection. And then the Bible says, teach them to observe all things. What in the world is that talking about? It's the 
church. Jesus told his disciples, he said, I'll build my church on this rock, talking about himself. I'll build my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You know what you need to be doing? Teaching all nations. Baptizing them. And teaching them to observe all things. Do what the church does. Reproduce. Reproduce itself. And if you do that, it shows that you believe. You know, sometimes I think, you know, people just don't believe the same Jesus in the Bible. You know why? Because they don't do what Jesus said to do. Were the disciples unbelievers? Were they lost? Were they unsaved? Oh, I would never say that. Not for anything. One of them was lost. The one who made the greatest accusation. He was lost. Judas was lost. But the rest of them were believers in the sense that they were born again. But Christian, they didn't act like it. They weren't doing what Jesus wanted them to do. They weren't preparing for His death. And that's what He wanted them to do. He tried to prepare them for, their, for His death. And one woman got it. The rest of them just didn't believe. You know why they didn't, want to, why they didn't believe? They didn't like it. They didn't want to. And you know today there are people that don't like Jesus' plan. Teach all nations. We come up with doctrines that prove that it doesn't matter if you teach all nations. Because why? Because we don't like Jesus' plan. Oh, do I don't want to just build up a church. A church is man's idea. It's just all men, men, men. No friend, it's Jesus' idea. And if it's done the right way, it's all Jesus. Well, I don't like it. I know. We can, you can tell by the people that aren't part of it. Who does, oh, I love Jesus. I worship Jesus, not His way. So you don't evidence faith like this woman did. Because you don't like it. You don't get to pick and choose what you believe, friend. You either believe Jesus or you don't. Guess what? When He said He was going to the cross, believe it or not, it happened. Believe it or not, it was the future. And when Jesus says, I'm coming again, believe it or not, it'll happen. Believe it or not, it's your future. So let's live by faith. Following the example of this woman who we remember today because she was the only one that believed. Father, Your Word is so plain, it's so clear, it's so simple to understand, and yet sometimes we cannot believe it because we do not like the message. Sometimes we do not believe it because it would cost us things that belong to You but we think belong to us. Father, sometimes we don't believe it because or we just have selfish hearts, we have selfish motives. Lord, if we will believe, Lord, we'll do things that will be remembered. We'll be right because we agree with You. Father, help us to believe. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to ask that you stand to your feet. We're going to have a hymn of invitation this morning. It's going to be page 381. We're just going to sing as you're all on the altar. That's a pretty practical application. If you're all on the altar, you'll be doing what Jesus wants you to do. You're here this morning, and maybe Jesus wants you to get with the program, His program in the local church. And maybe you could just exercise uh, faith in that by coming forward. Tell Brother Chris. Brother Chris, you want to join the church. Hey, listen, if you're born again, you've been baptized, you qualify to be, part, be a church member in Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church. It may be this morning that the Lord has spoken to you about something I've never mentioned, but God's Spirit has convicted you about something that you need to do business about. And so the invitation for you would be just right where you're at. Maybe instead of standing and singing, just remain in your seat in prayer. Maybe if you're able to do so, bow right where you're at. And just go before the Lord and take care of that matter. Respond to what He said to you. It might be that this morning uh, that you need help. You, need, you, you just say, you know what, I don't know for sure I'm born again. And I, I realize that there's not been a specific time that I've actually trusted Jesus. Friend, get over your pride. Listen, if anybody knew that, all they'd think was, I want them to be born again. We wouldn't think anything about you. They just think they need what I need. Come forward during the invitation. Tell Brother Chris. Raise your hand. Motion for him to come to you. He'll open a Bible if you're a man. And if you're a lady, he'll have a lady open a Bible and show you how you can know that you have eternal life. Okay, that's the invitation. Let's stand. Let's just do business with the Lord as the Spirit leads this morning. Page 381 is you're all on the altar. Page 381.
love he'll send from above. Who can tell all the love he will send from above? And how happy our hearts will be made. And with fellowship sweet, we shall share at his feet. Tell all the love he'll send from above. Oh, I'm sorry, verse um, verse 3. Oh, we never can know what the Lord will bestow of the blessings for which we have prayed till our body and soul he doth fully control and are all on the altar is laid. You know, she had no idea what God was going to do, did she? When she just said, I want to exercise faith. And you have no idea what God's going to do either. You know that, that He'll do what He says. If you preach the Gospel, people will be saved. They'll get baptized. They'll join the church. And uh, lives will be changed. But you don't know what it's going to be like in heaven. You don't know what the memory is going to be. And yet this morning we're thinking of a woman who just demonstrated faith. That's all she did. She just said, I believe. We had that wonderful example of that. The question for you would be, what about your life? Let me live for Jesus, live for faith. What well, Scott Dewey's come this morning. He's been driving up from Miami Beach, and uh, he's really an answer to prayer as we have been preparing to plant a church down in Miami Beach. We've talked about membership. When we start Miami Beach Baptist, it'll be a member of uh, the members of Fort Lauderdale Baptist that are part of that. Will uh, that'll be the way that, that church is actually started up until they are able to grow and be on their own? Brother Scott wanted to come membership this morning. Brother Scott, have you received Jesus as your Savior? Uh, 19, the spring of 1970. Amen. And so you've been scripturally baptized? Uh, twice. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Got it. Double done. Double duty. Double dipper. All right. Uh, Alright, well, you want to share anything by way of testimony? Well, I, I can say, you know, when I was in great, uh, junior high and high school in the 60s, I, I was seeking you know, and I, but I, I went to the a, a call, you know, and, uh, and I kind of, I guess I sort of believe in reincarnation, but it was, when I listened to Billy Graham uh, on TV, and I recorded it, and played it upstairs that evening, and I, and uh, I think the verse that really hit me was uh, Hebrews uh, 9.27, it's appointed unto men once to die, but after this judgment, so that conflicted with reincarnation. And I said, one's right, and the other was okay. Mm. It has to be wrong. And, I, and then the other thing, first, that I just want to mention that hit me like a ton of bricks, too, was that, but your iniquities have separated between you and God, and at His face from you that you will not hear. And I, well, Isaiah 59, 2, when I, and that, that I realized then that I was separated from God. I think that. That impacted me because I had thought maybe I was, well, I didn't know where I stood with God, but I wanted to know. But I, to know that I was separated, that was alarming and all that, and uh, I had to do something about it. And I, and I just believed it. You know. That's when, I, that night, you know, I really did uh, business with the Lord. You know. And he called upon the Lord to say, <coughs> Well, if you'd rejoice in His coming and receive Him in this local fellowship, would you say amen? Amen. amen? amen. Praise the Lord. Brother Scott, we're so glad to have you. We're looking forward to the ministry God gives him at this stage and time of his life in Miami Beach. God's doing great things. And he is, I just, I think we're beginning to 
see it. We're, we're just at the beginning of it. And we have so much ahead. Isn't it wonderful to have a bright future, to know that everything's going to be better and better and better? The old bodies that we live in, they're, they're getting worse and worse and worse, but our future is getting better and better and better, brighter and brighter. And praise the Lord for that. We have a wonderful hope in Jesus Christ. Well, we're going to dismiss with a word of prayer, and then following that, come up and shake hands with uh, Brother Scott, and then Shanice is going to get baptized this morning. And so, uh, Brother Alex will have the bus if you want to ride over. There is an auxiliary lot in Lauderdale by the sea now, so parking isn't so much of a problem if you don't mind paying the dollar an hour or so for it. Uh, so feel free to just head over there, but we'll meet at the beach right in front of Lauderdale by the sea at the public parking there, and Shanice will be baptized this morning. Shanice, do you want to join the church uh, and uh, on Statement of Faith in your baptism this morning? Okay, so she's going to get baptized. Shanice got saved a couple years, uh, a couple weeks ago in the invitation in the morning service. And so you know you've trusted Jesus as your Savior. Yeah, amen. All right, well, we're looking forward to growing Rodney and Shanice both and doing great things with them. But you may make sure to be there and encourage her with the baptism to be a witness of what she's saying. I'm going to follow Jesus and I'm identifying with his death and burial and resurrection. Okay, let's dismiss with a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for this day and for the opportunities that are in it. Lord, I just ask that, uh, that Brother Scott, that this would be a new beginning in his life of seeing you do even greater things than he's ever seen before. I pray the same for Shanice, Lord. I pray that as she begins to grow in you in fellowship, Lord, that as a church we would do right by her and teaching her to observe all things, that we'd be able to teach her and uh, to the, the uh, Christian life and how to live for Jesus. And Father, I just pray that you would bless and help them to grow and help them to bring others to Jesus as well. We thank you for what, what you'll do. We ask in Jesus' name. All right, thank you. You're dismissed. I'll see you at the baptism.